ないのか激しい風のささやきが君にもきらめくはずさ焼けつく愛の稲妻が空を Welcome to the Super Sentai Buddies. This is episode four of You Only Live Man Twice, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Choju Sentai Live Man. Each week, we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listeners. My name is Matt J, and with me, as always, is my co host and buddy, Mark. Mark, how are you doing today? I am doing real good, man. I am glad to hear it. I recently moved my recording rig into my library, and that's significant. For a couple of reasons. First, I get to podcast surrounded by all of my books, nice, which is just、nice. mentally very satisfying. <laughs> But more importantly, the library, the air conditioning works significantly better in here. My office is the one room of the house that the air conditioning kind of struggles to keep up with. Oh. So now it's very cool. That is nice. Especially because I know, like, I'm just working off a laptop here, but you actually have, like, a full tower computer and electronics in that office. Yeah, yep. So I can imagine that that makes a big difference. <laughs> it does. Sitting next to the computer, I, and it was, I, sh- I should have realized it far earlier, but the way I had things set up in the old office, I was sitting, like, right near the side where it vented out heavily. <laughs> Well, Mark, I always thought it's a little warm behind my desk, huh? It, it, it sounds like this move is both cool and nice. And you know what else is cool <laughs> and nice? What?、Uh, is episode four of Choju Sentai Live Man.、Uh, it is called Expose <laughs> the Dummy Man. But before we get into that, Mark, as always, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. What is our first star of the week? Our first star of the week, Matt, is kind of a catch all star, which you know, we like to do from time to time when we have a few things that lump under one heading. Yeah. And really, in this case, I think it's more of a moon than a star because I want to talk about Nintendo games for a bit. And、I've, I'm still, how, how many months are we in? Ten months in? I'm still playing a lot of Mario Odyssey. Oh, dude, I, I, it's a very, very good game, is the thing about that game. It's so good. And I'm, I'm glad to have somebody on the podcast with whom I can talk about the good Nintendo games. Because,、uh, of course, usually I'm talking to Dave. And oh, by the way,、uh, Dave is, he mentioned last week, he's traveling. We will hopefully have Dave back、um, beginning next week, but this week was just sort of hard for him to schedule.、Um, but that is good because that means we can talk to Nintendo, which is something I rarely get to do on this program. <laughs> yeah, not like the old glory days of Fallout. Hey, listen, fall, we, got a lot of, we got a lot of mileage out of Fallout. <laughs> It's hard to come up with new things to talk about every week, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so I have been playing just the last couple of days Kirby's Star Allies. Okay, how is this? I, I wanted to get it, but it seemed like the real beauty of this game would not fully like, come into being if I was just playing it by myself. Yeah, so here's how I would describe it. Well, it's very good. It's Nintendo doing what Nintendo does best. It's beautiful. The mechanics are extraordinarily tight. The responsiveness is incredible. You know, it's, it's Nintendo being Nintendo. But it is absolutely a multiplayer game, almost kind of a party game in a sense. It's, it's levels, it's a map. It's a party game in the same way that the new Super Mario Brothers games were. Right, that they're really just best enjoyed with several people. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. The, when you say the new Super Mario Brothers, you mean the ones with new in the title, where it's like four yeah, yes, people sorry, doing、yeah. side scrolling. <laughs> but specifically, why I want to talk about this game is, as you know, I've got a six year old daughter who loves her some video games. Yes. The Switch has been incredible for that. She can play Breath of the Wild. She plays Mario, although she struggles with some of the more complex platforms. Hey, listen, so do I. <laughs> but. Kirby Star Allies is the perfect game to play with your kids. It's so accessible. The controllers are pretty basic, but it's fun and complex, so it's not boring. For, like, I don't feel like I'm stuck trudging along in a dumb kids' game. That is great.、Uh, and, and listen, like, honestly, if it's just like a good Kirby game, like a good side scrolling Kirby game, it's been so long since we've had one of those that wasn't. Because、uh, I know like, the most recent Kirby games have all been sort of different gimmicks, right? Like the one, like you were a claymation ball and、right. you had to like 
like draw a little line for yourself to like roll along, which sounds right. like a great game, but is not what I think of when I think of Kirby games. <laughs> there have been a few good ones on the 3DS in the last handful of years, which uh, there's Planet Robo. There's some other one that name I'm forgetting. But my daughter has played those and like them, so she came into this game like equipped with a base set of Kirby skills. Okay. But anyway, yeah, it's it's we had uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit. We had some friends down this weekend who have three daughters, and several of the little girls were just playing Kirby together, and it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That sounds lovely. As much as I, I as a grown up, love playing video games, there's still something very pure about watching little kids just having fun playing Nintendo. It's it is the it is a beautiful thing. I, another multiplayer Nintendo game that I would love to play with people at some point. Uh, I bought it because I thought it was going to have more of a single player component, uh, and it okay. it doesn't really. It's the new Mario Tennis game, and it doesn't really have huh. that much of a single player component. Um, but the the good thing about it is that the game itself is very good. That's great to hear, because it's been a few years since we've had a really good Mario sports title. Dude, remember every Mario sports game that came up for the GameCube and how good oh, they were? Oh, man. I, I don't... Have we talked about on this show the 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 cigar box of money that went into our Nintendo <laughs> fund? Not that I recall. I mean, it's possible. Um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, if, if we haven't mentioned it before, uh, listeners, when we were in college, we kept a cigar box, um, a sort of... A, on a shelf above my desk and anytime that we all had like you know if you had money in your pocket like change or whatever it just all went right. into the cigar box and then like once or twice a semester and like four or five of us all sort of put in for this and then a couple of times a semester we'd take that money out and we'd put it like you know we'd roll up the coins and we'd add up the dollar bills and we'd go down to the bank and get like you know real adult money and then we would take that adult money to the store and buy a video game like that was our like group video <laughs> game fund and so we bought, like, so many GameCube games. Like, all of those yeah. weird, like, Nintendo sports games that look like they might be good, but you're not necessarily going to buy right. them. It was perfect. Well, the GameCube had really good multiplayer games it, it, in an era where that wasn't nearly as common. I think that's why so many GameCube games got bought. It was something all four of us could play. Yeah, I, I think it was the last console with... Was it the last console with four... Uh, inputs. I guess the the Wii had for Wiimote, like yeah, uh, like virtual yeah. slots. Um, but yeah, it was like all of those were good, and this one is very much along those lines. That we played a lot of tennis together in college. I'm very excited. Maybe when I come up this summer to watch an Indians game. Uh, yeah, that we would can be get great. Some Mario tennis on. Um, hopefully. Well, what I'll try to do is get good enough that I can show you how to play the game, but then forget <laughs> to have played it for like a month by the time you show up so that I will like be kind of bad at it again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and real quick before we depart this star, since we're talking cool Nintendo stuff, Pokemon Go released that new, I guess it's not really a DLC, it's just a whatever it is. They released a new upgrade to the game. And we're friends now, and we can send each other gifts, and it's amazing. It is very good. It's, like, it has made playing Pokemon Go exciting again in a way that it hasn't been for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, and and I had kind of trailed, so I used to walk every day over lunch down a walking path that had just a million Pokestops. I mean, no kidding, I'd pass 20 in half an hour or so. Oh, wow. And I played faithfully until job situations changed and I kind of dropped off and, and I got back into it a little and it just, there wasn't a lot to do. So I had a lull and this is a great time to jump back in. My wife plays and now we can trade. It's amazing. Dude, trading. I, I am looking forward to trading. Passing around gifts is fun, but trading, yeah. that is where it's at. Cause <laughs> there's always like some weird thing. It's like a, a Pokemon that it's not special. I just have never seen one and I'm yep. finally going to get a chance to trade for them. Um... Yeah, so that's that is our video game talk, folks. Yeah, lots of good Nintendo stuff. What is star number two, Matt? Uh, star number two is I just had my car back into the shop, <laughs> and I know, good. I know, I, I'm I'm a little surprised we don't have like a musical sting for this segment. <laughs> I'm kind of glad we don't. Uh, the The musical sting that I think it would be would be the. Uh, when you lose a race in Mario Kart Double Dash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Actually, dun, 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 Yeah. While, like, <laughs> Luigi slowly <laughs> shakes his head in sorrow. <laughs> yeah. And it replays scenes of your failure behind you. <laughs> that's that's kind of what it feels like every time the car goes into the shop. Um, <laughs> but this time it was actually nice because it ended up costing less money than I thought it was going to do. And, nice. and the thing is, I realized this is that it cost less money than I thought it was going to because it cost less than $300. And I think that in my head, like, when you go, when I'm taking my car to the shop, unless I know something is, like, very, very wrong or, like, you know, it needs an oil change or something, like, I think my base level is it costs $300 before tax, which means it costs, okay. and I also don't know what tax is, so I assume it's going to be like $312 <laughs> exactly. And if it's not exactly $312, I am either very sad or pleasantly surprised. <laughs> My wife has a very similar baseline for what is an acceptable trip to the garage with the car. If it comes out under 300 bucks or so, it feels like a win. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, that's all. I don't really have a lot to talk about. It was just <laughs> the big thing that was going on in my life. I had to get rides to work every day for a week. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it, it was really the realiza- the $300 realization that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> uh, Mark, what is our third star of the week? Third star, we're just, we're coasting through the greatest hits of the <laughs> Super Sentai Brothers stars here this week because third star of the week is Tabletop Games. Oh, nice. So, Anything in particular? I mean, I assume there's something in particular. <laughs> yeah, so uh, some mutual friends of ours, Cody, who has been on the show once or twice, uh, and his wife, Lo, your old college roommate, Eric, and his wife, Missy, came to visit us this weekend. Oh, that's great. It is. We have a house big enough to host multiple families, which is really fun. Uh, Eric, Eric's little girls came, and they're, which is, it's fun that our families are, are friends. It's extra fun. Because we can just shuffle them off to play together and they entertain each other. Oh, that is good. That is nice <laughs> when they start to hit that like self-sustaining age. Yeah, it's great. But anyway, while they were down, uh, our buddy Brian, who lives near me, also came over, which meant we had seven people, which meant we could play the rare full game of Mysterium. Ooh, that is a rare delight. It was Mysterium, if you don't know, listener, is a... It's a tabletop board game. It's a cooperative game that is kind of like Dixit crossed with Clue. Yes, crossed with ghost stuff. Yeah, so one person is the ghost of someone who died. Six other people are psychics trying to solve the ghost's murder. There's a bunch of mechanics that no one wants to hear explained over a podcast, but it's really fun. It's a weird game. It's best when played at maximum capacity, but it's rare that you have exactly seven grown-ups with an hour of free time and a giant table sitting Right, around. right. Uh, so we did that, which was great, and we also played a little of a... I told you we were hitting all of our greatest hits. A little of a role-playing game called Mithras. Okay, I, I don't think I know Mithras. It is... It's put out by a company called The Design Mechanic, who previously had the license to the RuneQuest series. Okay. Those words sound vaguely familiar. <laughs> <laughs> but after RuneQuest 6, they lost the license. I understand somebody's producing RuneQuest 7. I, I don't know who. But Design Mechanic repurposed their game engine as something called Mithras, and it's kind of an open engine, and they publish a bunch of different mods on the back of it. Okay, so it's sort of like GURPS, where, like, you buy the one... Actually, in GURPS's case, you buy, like, the two giant books where right. you learn the system, and then there are other, like, smaller books that say, like, hey, do you want to be a cyber ninja? Like, here's the book exactly. for you. It's, it's exactly that. And we were playing the classic fantasy mod, which is basically just D&D. But our buddy Eric has been running a, a campaign for us. We've done a couple of sessions now, and it's it's just a lot. It's I think what it is for me... And, and you and Dave have talked about this. It's scratching that D&D itch. And it's not exactly D&D, but it's classic high fantasy adventure. That is, And I've been oh, playing so a good. lot of like, I've played Mage recently and Hunter. I've been running My Little Pony, the role playing game for my daughter and her friends. Cool, cool. And there's just something great about getting back in that just classic high fantasy world where you're fighting hill giants and you're turning the undead. And, you know, I hate the undead. 
<laughs> Plus, it's our buddy Eric who steadfastly refuses to engage with anything popular, which is, I think, why we're playing Mithras instead of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> instead of picking up the game that is sort of universally lauded as like the <laughs> right. best version of the most classic game. He has bought Mithras, a thing that I, who have been playing role-playing games since I was 12, have never heard of. (laughs) We're not even in Pathfinder. We're we're in Mithras. Anyway, that's it. It's, again, not breaking any new ground. It was just a lot of fun. That was what I did with my weekend. It was a fun weekend. Right on. What? What is star number four, Matt? Okay, uh, well, we've already talked about video games. We've already talked about tabletop yeah. games. Uh-huh. Uh, so now it is time for the uh, the, the third and, I, and perhaps final version of, uh, of games. Those are the three <laughs> elemental games are video games, <laughs> table games, and bar games. Oh, oh, bar games, yeah. Uh, so this bar game, I actually don't even know if it counts as a bar game, although there is a bar at this place. Uh, this okay. past weekend was Corporate Challenge, which... Is like a citywide thing that if you, I mean, if you've never, if you or the place that you work have never done one of these, uh, they are in a bunch of cities. And basically, it's like I have a team from my office, and we send them to go in a tournament against somebody at your office. And okay. there's a bunch of different events. Like some people are playing volleyball, some people are go karting, uh, some people are playing tug of war or basketball So this is the sort of thing you do when you work in a hashtag fun office. Yes, when you are in a hashtag fun office and they <laughs> and they want to like make up company t-shirts and try to get your picture on a plaque somewhere uh, right. to show that everyone is smiling so they can put that up on like the recruitment website. Uh, <laughs> that is what I did. Um, and so my, my contribution to Corporate Challenge this year is that I joined the Shuffleboard team. You know, I've never played shuffleboard in my life. Well, uh, I, okay, we did actually play, I've played maybe three, four times now, because (laughs) near to me, um, not like right down the street, but like in the neighborhood, there is a new like shuffleboard bar. Okay. And it's in like, it's almost impossible to like get in because you have to like schedule stuff ahead of time. And most nights during parts of the year are filled with like leagues so you can't wow. just like go in and get a lane unless it's like a Thursday night. Um, Are the leagues all like seventy-year-old Italian gentlemen uh, who's playing shuffleboard in leagues? Um, it's either. I mean, I haven't been there on league night. I think it's mostly either like people my age who think it's like a fun idea to do okay. that sort of thing and want an excuse to like hang out with their friends and drink a beer, but not. But, like, do it in an organized way. Sure, I can't judge that. That's That sounds good. Um, and then probably also, like, 40, 50-year-olds who just, like, have been playing <laughs> shuffleboard and, like, are here to teach the youngins a thing or two. Um, so I've, I've been once or twice before, and then we went to practice uh, last week uh, just to try to really get, you know, get our skills in. Uh, and I am delighted to report that our team took second place. Wow, nice. And that's it. Oh uh, yeah! Well, congratulations, we, man. We went out. I woke up at nine in the morning on a Saturday uh, and went to a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and like I like they had told me when I was there the week before, like, oh yeah, man, we're gonna have like a brunch special. What what I did not realize is that their brunch special was a big pile of French fries with an egg on top. <laughs> that was like the only wow. thing that they had to eat. So I'm just sitting there with, like, a cup of coffee and a plate of fries and a beer, like, trying to, like, get myself together to, like, play shuffleboard well. I am I'm delighted that I survived the event, frankly. Was there, uh, like, a trophy or a plaque or something? Oh, there was a plaque. Place? Yes. Nice. Uh, yeah. So now now I do have my face on the plaque uh, in the, on the wall <laughs> um, in our hashtag fun office. Uh, Mark, that's the four star. Would you like to hear what our fifth and final star of the week is? I would. It is yet another game. We're swinging a rack back around to video games because I forgot to mention it earlier. <laughs> um, so after e- or during E3, they announced that Fortnite was going to be available for free on the Switch. And I thought, hey, Fortnite, as I understand it, is like the most popular video game in the world. I like video- Yeah, that seems to have happened at some point. Like, I like video games. Like, maybe I will like this video game that literally everyone loves. Yeah. And so I turned... Logical conclusion. And so I turned it on, and 
I, I think I just need to come to grips with the fact that I do not and perhaps never will understand this game. Um, <laughs> and as I can figure it out, like the the if you've never played, which seems pretty unlikely, frankly. Um, <laughs> but if you've never played it, the the idea is it's like a, I actually have not, so I'm listening. So it's a it's a shooter, and the the map that you are in gets progressively smaller throughout the course okay. of the match. Like there's a storm that's like closing in on you from all sides, and so. Okay. You have to, like, not only do you have to, like, find guns and shields and, like, healing items and then, like, run around and shoot other people, but you also need to, like, be moving into a tighter and tighter cluster of everyone who's playing. Sure. Okay. So, like, that that part of it I get. What I don't get is that, like, okay, there, there are a few modes. You can either play, like, every man for themselves or, like, a big 50 on 50 team. If I play every man for myself... Mostly what I do is I spend my time, like, running around trying to find someone to shoot at and then immediately getting shot and killed. <laughs> or if I play, like, the big 50 on 50 thing, I spend my time running towards the middle of the thing to try to find somebody to shoot at. And then I see a <laughs> bunch of people running around, but there's no sort of clear indication as which one of those people are right. on my team and which aren't. So I stand there, I shoot the wrong person, and then I immediately get murdered. Like, <laughs> I... Oh, and then also there's a component where people are just, like, building walls and, like, putting towers in your way, which yeah. which I guess is probably something to do with the fact that the game is called Fortnite. Like, there's a fort, fort part yeah, of it. Yeah, I've heard it described as a cross between a survival shooter and Minecraft. Yeah, man. I guess that's it. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> I I really thought like this is it. I now have an opportunity to get in on the zeitgeist, and I guess I right. do have that opportunity, but I do not have the capacity <laughs> to really properly like like z like zone in on this thing. So it's yeah. on my Switch. Uh, I could go play it right now. I don't see what the point would be, but Man, I, I I hope I, everyone I have... has fun with it. I have never been great at shooter games, PvP shooters to begin with. It's not my kind of my speed, but I bounced off of Fortnite very hard. I've watched a few videos. Uh, I I did a little like a play test of it, just trying to understand it because, like you, I like video games. I you know I grew up with video games. I think you and I have both been video gaming since the days of the Intellivision. Oh yeah, I definitely had an Intellivision, and I just. Fortnite, to me, was one of an increasingly alarming number of situations where I realized that I do not understand the kids these days. Yeah, and it's not just that I don't understand the kids these days. Like, I do not understand my own hobbies anymore. Right. The first, the first one of these I could actively remember having that really made me realize, like, oh, no, culture has moved past me now. I had a good run. I was in that 18 to 30 demo for a long time. But the first one that I realized was unboxing videos. Oh, yeah. That happened. I still, I still, I, I do not understand why those are a thing. And I realized that's because I'm an old person and I'm not with culture. Like, culture has passed me. And Fortnite was another one of those. I just, I looked at it. I gave it a real long thought. And it just, no, uh, I, I just don't, I don't. <laughs> well, Mark, this this is why I cling to the things of the '90s. And for example, <laughs> oh, actually, Live Man wasn't in the '90s. Uh, Live Man was an '80s show. I forgot for a second. Uh, That's all right. We can cling to some things in the '80s. Yeah, it's late '80s. That we were we were culturally aware by the late '80s. Sure, that's when I was playing in television. Yeah, watching like Ninja Turtles and things. Heck yeah. Anyway, uh, speaking of watching things from the '80s. We are going to take a break. We are going to watch episode four of Choji Sentai Live Man, and we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we've just finished watching episode four of Live Man, uh, and heads up, Live Man still rules. It does. Uh, this episode gives us something that I don't think I've actually ever seen in a Sentai before, which is not just like a monster of the week, but actually the monster of the week kind of being the creation of the like the the putties, essentially. Right. Yeah, that is that is interesting. Or maybe these are these double putties? There were putties in this show before, like in the first they're episode. Called, 
jimmers, right? Isn't that what our putties are? But yeah. these ones felt kind of like leveled up jimmers somehow. They're like the Z putties of jimmers. <laughs> right. And uh, that is actually a sentence that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I follow. I love Live Man right out of the gate. So I sat down to watch. I came up to my office a little little early. I hunted down the thing to watch. I started it, and the first thing out of the gate, and this happens to me every time we do this, it's someone saying, friends, why did you sell your soul to the devil? Yeah, I and do every for- time that- I do forget about that every time. <laughs> right, and that is what I remember. Oh, yeah, Live Man goes hard. Yeah, then there's a picture of an evil person shooting two animated butterflies with a laser gun. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a and dog on a skateboard. The... So there's the, the opening credits are kind of all over the place. <laughs> and like three of the main bad guys are the old classmates and best friends of our three good guys who betrayed them. Yeah, I, do we do we have to go back and remind the good people what is going on with Live Man, or should we assume that they... Let, uh, here, I'll, I'll take a crack at a 30-second summary. You correct me if I miss anything or say anything wrong. Okay. Because I think it's usually Dave's job to do the summary, right? Yes. So I'll jump in there. So Live Man initially opens up on sort of an international science academy where the best and brightest of all over the world are sent to help shape the future. And we meet in the beginning six friends, three definite friends, three other definite friends. There's some crossover in there. Sometimes it's unclear as to what it is. Anyway. Right. Definitely six, three, six like star pupils. Right. Three of them betray Science Island and sell it out to the Brain Army Vault, led by great Professor Bias, who is just a super genius scientist slash space military commander. I do love that, like, he's an evil scientist and his name is Bias. Like, I don't know (laughs) if that's on purpose, but, like, the idea that having a Bias is the most evil thing for a science villain is kind of the best. (laughs) It's beautiful. So these three traitors come back with the aid of some space military, and they just wreck Silence Island. They destroy it. They kill, uh, what was his name, Professor Hoshi? Oh gosh, I, like I have that. forgotten. I've forgotten the name of the professor. Uh, he was a cool dude. <laughs> they kill him. They wreck all of Silence Island, and they are here to take over Earth to make it a special place only for evil geniuses. Yes, but the and that sets up our live man. Yes, who are the three that survived? Yeah, and they as like I don't know it. It was originally part of like I think like their thesis project, and then like two of their friends got murdered with lasers. And so they yeah. turned it into like an actual thing. They they have created for themselves Sentai suits. So like they, they are the team. Um, and then Professor yep. Hoshi was sort of in secret building the... Uh, did he build them the robots or did he just build them the giant like underwater base? He, I believe, built the giant underwater base and built programming that adapted the robots from being like construction bots to being like science bots okay. or being battle bots, I think. In any case, I, I think that if you have not listened to our other Super Sentai Buddies episodes, I think that gets you enough up to speed that we can go into it. Yeah, there's three main rangers. They're fighting against the Brain Army led by three of their old friends. Yes. Uh, there is a weirdly attractive robot named Colin who is kind of their sidekick. Yeah, she their Alpha Five. She lives on the uh, what is it called? Machine Buffalo, which is their Machine Buffalo, <laughs> their underwater island. It's not an island. That's, it, it's kind of island shaped or kind of giant turtle shaped, but not exactly. And it is underwater. And that's where their yes. that's where their sexy robot lives. It's like a giant flying fortress, but it's flying underwater. Yeah. Uh, And that also serves as like the hangar bay for their giant robots. There's a lot of stuff going on in this show. It is. Yeah. Live Man covers a lot of ground quickly. So we open this week, though, like up in the flagship of Brain Army. Yeah. At least I think that's where it is. Yeah, it is. That is what the Brain Army Vault is talking, and they're saying, you know, we're almost ready. Like, everything is kind of in place um, to, like, really start attacking Earth in earnest. Like, they thought they were going to roll it over initially. They ran into Live Man. 
And now they've sort of regrouped and are ready to attack again. Right. And this week, so Beautiful Beast Kemp or Dr. Kemp says that they have to make or they have to topple Earth quickly so they can make it a home only for geniuses. But to do that, they need to eliminate the live man. And Dr. Mazenda steps forward and says she has a plan. And what I have learned is this is sort of the theme for the first major arc of Live Man. So for the first X number of episodes, it'll be one of our big three, Dr. Kemp, Dr. Mazenda, and Dr. Oblar, kind of taking turns proposing evil plans to Great Professor Bias. Right. They are like their science experiments that they're going to go run down on Earth. Yes. Now, and this this one is is a Dr. Mazenda plan. And yes. she, okay. Now, you remember earlier when we said that these three were humans that had had themselves, like, turned into evil space monsters, right? Right. But other than uh, Dr. Oblar, like... Dr. Kemp and Dr. Mazenda are both, like, they can turn into weird monsters, but they're mostly just humans, right? Yeah. Now, yeah, they can turn it on and off. So, Dr. Mazenda's plan is to take, essentially, a putty and turn yep. it into what he, she calls a dummy man that can perfectly mimic what what a human, like, looks and acts like. And then she's yeah, going to send can, the, he can pass for human among the humans. Yeah. And she's going to send that down. And not and I want to be clear. This will pass as a generic human. It's not passing as a specific <laughs> human. It's not like oh arguably the most generic. Right. Like human. it's not like oh we've made this and it's going to replace the prime minister. Like no, she's going to send this right. thing down and it's going to be a factory worker. So my <laughs> question is this. So she's she's making these dummy men which will like then go down and, you know, do her bidding on Earth while pretending to be humans, why doesn't she just go herself? <laughs> or why doesn't Kemp go? Like, they look human. They can just go. They already look, know how to act human. They don't want to wear those drab brown jumpsuits, man. <laughs> I I do kind of love the idea that Dr. Mazenda is so against the idea of putting on a brown factory worker's jumpsuit <laughs> that she invents a robot to do it for her because she refuses to be any less fabulous than she is in her like full evil space regalia. That is one of my favorite things about Live Man is the late 80s outer space look of the bad guys. Oh, it's so it's good. gorgeous. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so, so she's she's creating this dummy man and she's sending it down and it goes down to this factory and it's just sort of wandering around and people look at it, but you know, like you don't know everyone that you work with. If somebody walks by that you don't recognize, you don't immediately think, ah, that's probably a space robot. Okay. Right, right. Let me, let me take a quick sidebar here. If when you see someone you don't recognize, you do think oh, that's probably a space robot, uh, you should talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You maybe have been watching a little too much Super Sentai. So this factory is a natural gas-like plant. Oh, hang on. We got to roll back for just a second because we skipped past the existence of Mazenda number five. Oh, oh yes. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> because to get the dummy man down to Earth... Mazenda leads everyone into her laboratory kind of to show them like, hey, here's my clever experiment. Here's the thing that I built. And in here is a a beast who has transfer powers. Yeah, it's OK. This is weird because it seems as though the monster of the week is going to be the dummy man, right? Yeah, absolutely. But dummy man... Who is, if we didn't mention it, he is just a jibber. I think we said Yeah, that. I think he has a slightly different head. Like, I don't quite remember what they all look like. But I think he right. has a slightly different, like, head shape. But the thing is, like, dummy man isn't good for, like, a plot for an episode. But dummy man don't grow. Like, there's no cool, like, giant version of dummy man. <laughs> so they no. also have to introduce pretty early on this weird teleportation monster. Yeah. Whose name was Den Seduno? Den the rough translation is just teleportation brain. Yeah, I think. Yeah, Denzo Denzo Dzuna. That's it. Which is difficult to say. 
So I might just call him Denzo because that's mostly he just says Denzo a lot like he's a Pokemon. <laughs> yes. So you think that's what's going on in this scene. We think that Mazenda has just led the dummy man here to get good old Denzo to transport him down to Earth with his special transformation powers. But first, she just pauses to show off her homemade perfume. Yeah. And and she puts it on and the dummy man like almost collapses. <laughs> And several of the Jimmers in the background, as well as Dr. Kemp, make kind of grimacey faces. And when she asks, like, oh, what's wrong? He says, oh, it's, um, I've, I've never smelled something that powerful and beautiful before. <laughs> She's like, yeah, a lot of people have problems with how powerful and beautiful this amazing smell is. Get down to Earth. And then she sprays him with it. I'm not I'm not clear why other than to maybe punish him for grimacing at how it smells. Maybe it, it if there was thinking behind it, it's terrible thinking because this is going to cause problems for Mazenda immediately. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, this perfume is called Mazenda number no. five. Of course it is. Uh, so uh, as I was jumping to earlier, Dummy Man goes down to Earth to this natural gas plant. Right. And he just like opens up what seems to be a random tube and drops a canister in it. And by doing this has tainted the natural gas of every, like all natural gas in the city. In Yeah. Just in all of, to- it, 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 it looks like he opens a plastic hatch and shoves in an extra large bar of soap. And somehow Every bit of natural gas in all of Tokyo becomes laughing gas. Yeah. You know how all gas is basically the same. You just need to introduce it to some soap and then it becomes a different gas. (laughs) Right. Yes. We, though, we get to see the effects of this initially by way of the kitchen of a small restaurant where our live men team have gathered to have some lunch Apparently in the middle of, like, they're on patrol, Megumi says. Yeah. Now, it is weird to see them on patrol because I am used to watching O-Ranger when people are, like, in their uniforms all the time. Oh, yeah. Good point. Um, But these three are, like, quote-unquote on patrol, but they're just wearing, like, regular clothes. Uh, And they are just having some lunch. And so Megumi has thought ahead to the fact that they're just stopping in somewhere for lunch and has gotten, I don't know, something light that is probably like easy and quick to make. Yeah, a salad or something. And she is finishing off her lunch and is very happy to have done so. The other two apparently have ordered like a giant like beef curry bowls that is taking like an (laughs) hour to get prepared and they are going crazy with hunger. Yeah, the server's swinging by telling them, hey, it's going to be a few more minutes on the stew. And Yasuki and Joe just cannot deal with any further delay. They are upset. And, like, they are trying to, like, eat the, like, the little, like, after dinner (laughs) mints that get dropped off for Megumi. They're like, oh, my gosh, there's something that I can consume. (laughs) And, And while they are sort of casting about in their fit of starvation, they hear raucous laughter coming from the kitchen. And they are so angry that the chefs might be enjoying themselves instead of solely focused on preparing their stew that they storm back there to investigate. Right. Because how dare anyone enjoy their job? (laughs) Right. People who work in food prep should be suffering at all times. uh, That's 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 the lesson of the week here, folks. Apparently it's a weird lesson. (laughs) Uh, No. So they, they roll back and. Yosuke and Joe are immediately overcome with the laughing gas. Like, they see the fact that their stew has been on the stove for too long and is now, like, completely burnt. They think this is hilarious. And then we get just a short montage of kitchens throughout Tokyo. Yeah, I, I guess it's just meant to show that, like, this was not a focused attack on this restaurant. Right. This is how we know it has affected, apparently, every oven in all of Tokyo. Uh, So, Megumi runs into the kitchen, realizes what's happening, 
like grabs her two comrades, yanks them out of the kitchen, leaves everyone else in the kitchen, by the way. Right. But right. she grabs uh, Yosuke and Joe, like throws them in their chairs, splashes cold water on their face, which is apparently the immediate antidote to laughing gas. Yeah. Yep. And says, hey, uh, clearly there's a problem. We need to go check it out. And she, because I guess she's a, I mean, okay, never mind. They're all geniuses. We talked about this earlier. Sure. Yep. They are science uh, geniuses. So she is a science genius and has realized that if there's something happening with the natural gas, she should go to the nearby natural gas plant. So she hops on her bicycle and rides away. Apparently she's the only one with a bicycle because the other two just run <laughs> after her. <laughs> They'll catch up eventually. But yeah, she is not waiting around for those fools. And when she gets to the, I guess, the natural gas production plant. She talks to, I don't know, the foreman or whoever the boss is in charge. And he just kind of shrugs her off. Yeah, well, he says, like, well, that's cert- it's not possible that it's coming from the plant because we haven't seen any suspicious people around here. <laughs> and as he's saying that, the dummy man is walking by, basically, like, with his hands shoved in his pocket, whistling and staring at the sky. Yeah. Um, and they're like, wow, well, I mean, I guess if nothing's been going on, and Megumi, again, super genius, like, stops for a moment, sniffs the air and says, hang on a second. Like, that is a very recognizable <laughs> smell that I'm smelling right now. I really love that she solves this episode Scooby-Doo style. <laughs> she just literally sniffs out a clue. It's amazing. Yeah, so... She she smells Mazenda number five in the air, and she says, Hold on, guys. I know that smell. And then we get a flashback... To, like, back <laughs> to on Silence Island. And what I love about this is that, like, Megumi and Mazenda, when they were apparently roommates on Science Island, um, yep. like, they had different hairstyles than they do now. So to, be, to put in this flashback... Okay, so let me let me just break this down. The people who made this episode were like, okay, we need to find some way for... Megumi to like see through the perfect disguise of the dummy man. What if she's yeah see- something like, something has to tip Mazenda's hair. Yeah, like what if she smells something weird? Well, what would she possibly <laughs> smell? I don't know. What if he's wearing some sort of like distinctive cologne? Oh well, this is a Mazenda plan. What if it's perfume? Okay, it's perfume. Well, how would she know that it's, <laughs> that it's the perfume? Okay, well we need to establish a backstory for how she recognizes this perfume. Well, how are we going to do that? Okay, so we need to build a set. <laughs> we need to build a separate like dorm room set where we're going to set them up. We'll get them into hair and makeup. It's going to take at least two hours to give them a completely different look. Um, then we're going to roll them in there. This oh, so this scene is going to last like five minutes to really uh, make use of all this time and effort. Take it's going to be 30 advantage. seconds. It's going to be 30 seconds in a dorm room. And all it's going to be <laughs> is Mazenda puts on her homemade, uh, like f- laboratory grown perfume. Uh, Megumi says, wow, that's really strong. And Mazenda says, well, if you don't appreciate a great, amazing smell like this, then you're not a woman. You're just a little girl. And that's it. So this- this perfume must smell terrible, right? Everyone who's smelled it has reacted negative. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, like, listen, I am not a perfumier, but, like, I don't think that you make perfume with, like, a chemistry set, right? <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. I feel like... I also really love the notion that she must have rebranded it, because her name wasn't Mazenda at the time. That's her, like, evil scientist name. Her oh, name was just, that's like, right. R- Ryu or something. Oh, so she must have rebranded her own to buy a scent. bunch of new bottles. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Because like, I, I bet that when she was like, she's in high school. She's a super genius. She's good with chemicals. She's like, I could make my own perfume. <laughs> like, doesn't research how perfume is made. Just like, well, I know if I put these chemicals together, it'll smell like something. Yep. And refused to believe anyone who told her otherwise. Of course not. She's a super science genius. And she's evil. 
<laughs> I love her defense too. It's so, it's such a teenagery defense. Like, well, the only reason you don't understand this is you're just not an adult. You're still a kid. Yeah, it's it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and it is. It's over. I mean, honestly, the entirety of the scene may have been fifteen to twenty seconds. Yeah. So we, after those 15 to 20 seconds, we cut back to present day, uh, present day in yep. 1988, uh, or whatever year the show <laughs> came out. And Megumi's like, well, I'm obviously going to follow that weird, that guy who smells like our enemy. <laughs> he just wanders <laughs> after him. Uh, like she corners him and says like, hey, bro, why, why you smell weird? Uh, he insists that it is not perfume, but it is in fact cologne. So, so the dude just wanders away after insisting that like this very <laughs> distinctive evil perfume is just some cologne he had. Yeah, and the uh, the dummy men are not really designed for improvisation. No, no, they are designed to like kind of act like a human, right? And, and so she just follows him. Not even, like, she's maybe 10 paces back. Yeah, she's, like, kind of behind a bush, but not really. Yep. And as the dummy man is walking, he sees an old woman struggling to carry a bag up some stairs. It's, like, a, a very large bag. Yeah, it's, like, she's hunched over. It's on her back. Yeah. Imagine the cover, the, what, the early cover of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. It's that bag. Yeah. So this woman is apparently carrying the the weight of sin on her back. <laughs> um, and the dummy man walks over and, like, takes her hand to sort of help her up the stairs. And Megumi's like, oh, he's helping an old lady. I must have been wrong. This clearly <laughs> is universal. A, yeah. The universal action of a good man. Yes, yeah, so he's helping an old lady up the stairs. And then she starts to walk away. And as she starts to walk away... The dummy man, like, doesn't try to help the old lady with the bag. He's just holding the hand. And then he kind of starts, like, jogging up the stairs and dragging her along with him. <laughs> yeah. And Megumi, like, hears her shouting and is like, oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. This can't be true. Like, <laughs> I thought you were a good man. And then she runs up the stairs and confronts him. And it's like, hey. The true act of kindness would have been to help her with the bag, not just to hold her hand. Your actness, like your your actness, your kindness is just an act. It's a sham. You're not a real kind man. You, you're clearly a monster. And plus, there's the smell, which we've already covered. I know you're evil. <laughs> it is amazing. And then she just punches him down the entire staircase. Yeah, and as he falls, he sort of flickers in and out of being the human and being like the dummy, like the straight up dummy man robot. Yeah, yeah, and then he runs away like a child who thinks he's an airplane. Yeah, he like we see this guy run for about as long as it took to see that flashback earlier, and the whole time he just has both arms straight out to the side. <laughs> and and Megumi's just chasing him. Eventually kind of into an open field, I I think. Yeah. Uh, and she kind of like catches up to him. But as she does, uh, Mazenda appears. Mm -hmm. And they sort of have it out. And uh, Megumi tells Mazenda like, oh, like I was able to suss this out because your dummy men are not able to like capture the goodness of a human heart. So <laughs> yeah. that's how I knew you were involved. Also perfume. What's up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Your perfume is still terrible. Um, and and then the, then they just fight. And is I have in my notes here. I forgot that she was made out of guns, because in case you forgot, <laughs> yes, Mazenda's is. evil monster form is that she's just full of guns. She's got finger guns. She is the she's got machine Mazenda elbow guns, probably a wrist gun. It's very good. Yeah, just gun. Every part of her is gun. It's all gun. It's guns all the and way it's down. Awesome. It's it's a ridiculous conceit, but somehow in execution, it's just amazing. I mean, this is kind of the conceit of Trigun, right? That, that well, I guess he's not made out of guns. He does have that one gun arm. Well, right. The real conceit of Trigun. Never mind. I, I don't want to. I don't want to get on a Trigun <laughs> jag here. <laughs> I 
think we would have a difference of opinion anyway. That is an entirely different podcast where you try to convince me that Trigun is good and you can't do it because Trigun's bad. <laughs> it's just you every week with a different guest host trying to talk <laughs> to you into liking Trigun. Yeah, anyway, so she, I think, uses her elbow gun to shoot Megumi off of the roof of a building that they've somehow ended up on. She certainly shoots her off of something tall. And at this point, the boys finally catch up. Yeah. And are instantly tricked by a wave of dummy men. Yeah, so, like, and listen, when you say, like, a wave of dummy men, she summons a wave of them. There's, like, an energy flash, and suddenly there are six (laughs) dudes. And Joe's response to this is not, oh, wow, Mazenda can summon evil dudes. It's, oh, my gosh, you guys, this is a dangerous fight. You guys need to get somewhere safe. (laughs) You unexplained suddenly appearing office men and construction workers need to get out of here. Um, but of course, Megumi knows what is up. And so <laughs> so these dudes are all like in a straight line walking towards them. Not like single file, right. but they are like walking abreast. And right. <laughs> Megumi just jump kicked one of them in the head. And then they just like <laughs> like row of dominoes, like knock each other over in a heap. It's beautiful. It's the greatest. It really is. It's so good. But Gumi is just, she is destroying this episode. She is the best thing in this show. Yeah. And I also really like that, um, like, the dummy men are built to look like humans and kind of act like humans. But, like, they are not designed to be soldiers. So, no. like, they, they're an effective distraction. But as soon as Megumi goes at them, they just, like, collapse. Like, literally collapse. It's yes. extremely good. And at this point, it looks like the tide of the battle may turn, but the guys haven't henshined yet. And... Oh, this is when Denzo shows up. That's right, yeah. And, um, Machine Mazenda manages to sort of wrap an energy whip around Megumi's neck. And Denzo, remember Denzo from the beginning? He shows back up and transports them all to some secret lair. Yeah, like before the guys can really have time to react. Right. So the guys weren't transported, but all of the bad guys and their now captive Megumi. And a minute later, she'll wake up in a laboratory. Yeah. So she's she's in this laboratory and she's tied up. And Mazenda is talking about how she's going to kill her, but that it would be too sad for Megumi to die al- to die and go to hell alone. So she's yeah. also going to go get the other two so they can all go to hell together. Yeah, Megumi wakes up. To her old roommate and friend saying to her, well, I guess it would be sad if you had to go to hell alone. She was not a good roommate. This this is a children's program. (laughs) What is going on here? I mean, I guess that's a, you know, friendship is important. It's a good lesson for this show to teach. Sure. Yeah. Never go anywhere alone. Buddy system. Yeah. Be careful with who you choose to be your school roommate. These are good I rules. I start watching Brian. Hey, listen, Eric has never tried to sell me, send me to hell with or without other people. <laughs> so she pulls down a display screen so that, Maz- so that Megumi can watch while they kill her friends. Which, harsh. Very harsh. Yeah, I, right. The killing doesn't work, obviously, but still, that's a pretty baller move. So what, what's happening here is, remember, Denzo is like a teleportation monster, right? But he's also got, yes. like, laser blasts. So apparently, and this is a very good idea, if you're a teleporting laser monster, like, Denzo doesn't leave the room. He's just teleporting laser blasts to where the other two yeah. are. And so they're just, like, it running away awesome. from being shot by kind of nothing. There's just explosions everywhere. Yeah, they are driving through the countryside on their moto machines, those kind of motorcycles they have, and just dodging electricity bolts that are appearing out of nowhere. My interpretation of this is that Denzo is sort of like early Sue Storm, when they realize, like, well, this is kind of a limiting power set. We need to figure out some way to translate. Like, we're just going to add a little bit on to this. Yeah. Um, but it is a great use of those two combined powers. It's, it's clever. Well, okay, it is a great use initially. It turns out to be a bad call because Colin, the sexy robot who lives in their underwater base, 
Um, right. She says, oh, I was able, like, she's traced the call, basically. She, she can tell where this transportation energy is coming from. Using the super Doppler. Using the super Doppler. Uh, so she is like, okay, like I know where these lasers are coming from. You need to like go to like X point. Yeah, it, which it turns out is just a cave on the beach and not a spaceship in outer space. Yeah, I, I mean, to be wait, is this is this must be the same cave that we saw early in the episode where she was uh, making the Mazenda number five. Yeah, well, maybe the teleportation powers don't like extend through. You know, hundreds of miles of cold, dead space. Yeah. I, I do like the idea that she was setting up her lab to make her perfume, and everyone on the space station complained <laughs> so much. They're like, listen, I'm sorry. We cannot have that in here. You've got to take it somewhere else. I will accept that headcanon. That's good. So they... <sighs> I'm going to be I'm gonna be honest. There's a second here where I turned away from my notes to write something down. <laughs> and when I came back, there were just two dudes with like bald caps with ho- mohawks on top of the bald caps and like <laughs> yeah. big baggy trench coats and uh, like round sunglasses wandering into this cave. And I don't know <laughs> if I missed something. You did not. Okay. No, that was... They, we just cut into that hard. Colin says, you've got to get to that cave. And we are just left to draw the conclusion that somewhere along the line, they decided that the best way in would be to dress up like extras from a very low budget post-apocalyptic 80s movie. Yeah. So they, so they roll in. And I guess the play here is that they are pretending to be dummy men that are <laughs> but dummy men yes. that have like gotten like broken and are faulty and need to be repaired, which is why they're acting weird and dressed in a way that she wouldn't have anticipated. Right. I don't know how many it's... dummy men she made that she could have, like, lost track of two of them. And, and further, they don't push the conceit more than about eight seconds. Why did you even bother? I think it was just to, like, get up close for a second. I guess so. They do wink very broadly at Megumi, though. Yeah, and then, so yeah, th- that is the plan. They walk, they just walk in and untie Megumi, and then the fight starts again. <laughs> Which, I mean, it works. I can't fault them for their, like, obviously successful plan. Yeah. So they fight on, like, the cliffs of the beach for a minute, and then Denzo remembers that he has uh, teleportation powers. It just teleports them all to some, I, I don't even know, it's like an empty pocket dimension. It's, it's a dimension. Listen, sometimes you got to fight in a dimension. I like dimensions. Yeah. I think I talked about this a few weeks ago. <laughs> but there, there is another thing going on in this part of the episode where like, man, I don't know if I was like falling asleep during the early part of this episode. I feel like I wasn't, but Yosuke and Joe are talking about, like, oh, my gosh, Megumi, will you please forgive us for not believing you? Like, they are acting as though they had, like, really wronged her earlier in the episode. And I... Yeah, no, you didn't miss anything. The the last five minutes of this show are cut together very, very hard. Okay. They jam a lot in. It jumps around without connecting very well. Maybe... I think I think someone just messed this episode up in the editing bay. Maybe they're talking about the fact that they didn't believe Megumi that she smelled Mazenda's perfume. That that could and be. And so like let that's her, like reasonable. they let her go off alone, and that's when she got captured. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that'll do. That'll, yeah. That'll that's, work. That's, okay. This episode works. We just need to massage it a little bit. Yeah. We we'll patch the bits that they cut out in editing. Uh, but they don't stay in the other dimension very long at all. It's just a black dimension. There's nothing here. It's all. It's all. Yeah. Black. There's some smoke. But uh, Megumi like right. shoots like three spots on Denzo, which I think is like where his teleportation energy was coming from, and it like fizzled yeah. out his ability, and they all reverted back to their normal dimension. Yeah, she gets out that dolphin bow and just, like, fires three quick arrows. Oh, hell yeah. Love that dolphin bow. 
it it's really cool. I, I Megumi is amazing in this episode. Um, man, do you remember that there are two other Rangers that we have not met yet in this show? Yeah, I, I presume there are. They got to show up eventually. Yeah, like, there right? are five live men. I don't know when they show up, but I hope they are at least half as cool as Megumi. Yeah. <laughs> so breaking the transformers, the teleporter. Whatever it is, apparently undoes his teleportation instead of just stranding them in this dimension forever. Which, yeah, I definitely would have assumed that that would have been the case. (laughs) And they end up back on the beach where they call the biomotion buster, that giant like three person shoulder cannon. Yep. And then they just zap the heck out of this dude. He dies. They do. And then I remember that Giga Phantom exists. Yeah. Gardenoid Gash and his Giga Phantom Cannon. Uh, Gardenoid Gash, if you do not remember, as I had forgotten, uh, is a totally radical, like, scary robot with a big gun that shoots, like, a weird energy cyclone at a robot corpse that then turns it into a giant robot. Or a giant monster, I guess. That's my favorite thing about the Giga Phantom Cannon, is unlike most Sentai shows, it generally functions after the enemy has already died. Yeah, like, I guess that, no, that's the case in a lot of shows, I think. Okay, okay. I mean, not all of them. And it, I it know ju- uh, in in Die Ranger, the monsters generally made themselves grow by throwing, like, throwing down their, exp- uh, exp- gr- gr- what are those things called? <laughs> yeah, whatever the growy grenade was. Yeah, there's a little, like, silver bomb and it makes them giants. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But in this case, the Growy Grenade is a giant 80s space cyborg with an enormous shoulder cannon. By the way, this character, so far as we have seen so far, does has no other function. He only arrives nope. to shoot this laser. Yeah, I hope he lasts all season because I really love Gardnoid Gash. Um, and let's see. Then the live men just like call back to ma- to Machine Buffalo to summon their ships. Right? Is that where we're at? Uh. Oh, um, the Megumi gets knocked in the water. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And for some reason, even though she is the blue dolphin, um, I guess she can't like cannot breathe underwater. Like you would think sure. that her yep. side, her like aquatic based super suit would have like an aqua lung <laughs> in it, but it does not. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so they summon the machine buffalo to shoot out the. What is hers called? Because it's not one dolphin. It's two dolphins that are, like, attached at the side. It's called the Aqua Dolphin. The Aqua Dolphin. Which looks very yeah, little like a dolphin. Right, there is the Aqua Dolphin, ah, Yellow Lion, and, and a Falcon. And I can't remember the name of the Falcon. Yeah. But, but in any case, they summon Aqua Dolphin to, like, dive after Megumi. Uh, to go, like, rescue her from sinking into the deep. It does. She comes back on land. Oh, no, while she's underwater, there's, like, an underwater dogfight. Yeah, I absolutely wrote in my notes that she uses dolphin missiles to destroy some sort of underwater fighter that I I don't know where it came from, how it got there. Yeah, it's extremely good. Uh, It only lasts for, like, two seconds, but I'm always delighted when the, like component pieces of the Megazord actually do stuff on their own. And especially underwater, I don't think I've ever seen that. It's really cool. And again, Megumi's just killing it this episode. It's 2018. She's crushing it. Yeah. After she dispatches like half a dozen underwater fighter jets, she, uh, she rises back above Aqua Dolphin can fly just as well as it can go underwater, and she forms up with uh, Land Lion and Jet Falcon to form the live robo. That's what it's called. Uh, Yeah, so she does that, and then, like, at that point, the fight is basically over. I don't remember there being anything special that Hook goes on here. So far, and we'll see if this changes later on in Live Man, but so far, once it gets to Live Robo... Things end very, very quickly. There's usually the robo beam and then the super live crush. There's not there's not a lot of fight. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, to be fair, that's 
there is a pattern that these shows follow where like when the giant robot is introduced, it is unbeatable for a long time. And then there's a bit where the robot has trouble. Uh, and true, then yeah. when something actually manages to defeat it around like, you know, episode 15 or 20, everyone goes like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is crazy. It's the strongest monster in the world. We're going to have to build another robot or like, you know, strap another robot on this one like a backpack or get this robot a new sword or <laughs> plug a new like energy source into it or something. Right. Give it a new Discover hat. our sixth ranger. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much it. Uh, it's over. They go back to the like, I guess like the dining room of Machine Buffalo is where they are. Yeah. And which looks suspiciously like the dining room of that restaurant. It's. I mean, it's not dissimilar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they put together. Uh, oh, sorry. They, they don't put anything together. I think I'm still thinking about robots coming together. Uh, sorry, dude. Yeah, it's, it's the been men a day. sit around. The men sit around and wait for the ladies to make them food. Well, I, I yes, they do. And then they say, not only are you like a super genius and great at everything, you're also a good cook. And I thought at that moment that she was going to, like, chide them for, like, belittling her. But she's like, yeah, no. <laughs> I am a good cook. Being a homemaker is great. And it's it's maybe not the best part of the episode. She doesn't actually say being a homemaker is great. Although, actually, being a homemaker is great. I know I'm getting into some thorny territory here. I'm going to back out. No, I'm with you. I, I hear where you're saying. It's weird because it's the 80s and there are two dudes who just have their feet up waiting for the, the ladies to wait on them. That said, uh, one more time, apparently Megumi can just do everything. She's amazing because she is so far the best live man. She is the best detective on the team. She's clearly the smartest member of the team so she's far. She's got the best nose. And she's a great cook. Yeah. She can do it all. Yeah. Okay. So I know we are not doing uh, the, we're not entering these monsters into the Creature Royale. Did we have a closing segment for these episodes? I don't think so. I think we usually just kind of do a real quick recap of any, almost like the old high points, low points. I mean, the high point is just Megumi is great. Yeah, Megumi's great. Live Man is great. Uh, the the low point, I mean, I guess, the like we said, the editing was a bit rough uh, near the end. It got a little hard to follow. Also, I will cop to this. I am feeling kind of sick and might have actually dozed off in a few points. <laughs> if you did i still had the same confusing experience as you at the end but yeah it's just it's always fun and we don't do it often it's a couple of times a year but it's always fun to get back to live man and remember just how great of a show it is yeah um so i guess that that is going to do it for another episode of you only live man twice the increasingly misnamed uh, side project of this show <laughs> um because at this point we have live man four times um, yeah, we have. Hopefully, we will be back next week, uh, Dave and I, with a uh, sort of standard episode of For Your Eyes, O Ranger. Um, if we are not, then you might get to hear about Live Man sooner than you think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for now, that is going to do it for another episode of the Super Sentai Buddies. Before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all you can email the show at supersentaibrothers at gmail.com. If you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we're talking about on Twitter, we are at Super Sentai Bros. If you like the show, and I hope that you do, please remember that shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. Uh, rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts. That is going to help other people find the show. Uh, the Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio, which is to say that Mark does all the work. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It is legitimately my pleasure, and I don't say that because it's the polite societal <laughs> response to being told thank you. I like I like being on this side of the mic, and you and Dave are two of my best friends. It's real fun to do a thing with you. It is also fun to have you on when we do get the chance. Um, speaking yeah. of you being on the other side of the microphone, though, um, why don't you tell the listeners where they can find you and the other Retrograde Orbit Radio projects in which you are involved? Sure. So like you say, every week, check out RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. You'll see the full staple of Retrograde Orbit Radio programs. For a little bit of a teaser, we're working on adding a new program uh, that may be here in July. That's exciting. Keep an eye on the website for that. It's not the next one I thought we'd be adding. We still have another secret <laughs> project in the works, but well, something else kind of came up in lots between. Lots of projects. And you can hear me every week on... 
Mount Olympus, the Hercules and Xena podcast. Thank you, Mark. Uh, once again, this has been the Super Sentai Buddies. I'm Matt. I'm Mark. And we'll see you next time for the greatest show on Earth. I listened to this show too much and I almost said I'm Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're